This is Tim O'Brien with O'Reilly Media. We're sitting with Bob Lee today. If you have an Android phone, you have Bob Lee to thank for the operating system. Bob, what are you talking about at Oracle's Open World? Do you have a presentation at 1230? Actually, I'm giving a basic Java talk about Java references, um, so specifically weak references, phantom references, soft references. Um, my experience there comes from a couple places. One, working on uh, first the Google Collections and then the Guava libraries. I created a framework called MapMaker, which basically lets you map uh, weak or soft referenced keys to weakly or soft referenced values. Um, so I learned a lot about uh, references from a user standpoint there, and I also built up quite a few libraries to help you use them. Um, also working on the Dalvik VM, which is able to run uh, code written in Java, uh, I also had to help out with the garbage collector and really understand the semantics. Uh, references. So I just want to get this straight. You worked on the Dalvik VM, Correct. not necessarily the operating system. I, I probably got that a little wrong. Oh, that's okay. And that's something that I've always noticed about you is that you work on these big projects that have global consequences, but then you're focused on these things like phantom references and weak references. What what is your? How do you think about Java? I mean, what 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 leads you into these sort of? Uh, Spaces. Well, the reason that I really latched onto that was because it was just something that was not well understood. There's okay. uh, not that much written about it, and what is written about it is uh, tends to be factually incorrect. Um, and there were lots of open questions for me. It was just like, wait, why does Java even have weak references and okay. phantom references? And for example, the answer there is, in case you missed my talk, is because Java has finalizers. If Java shouldn't have had finalizers. It should have just had weak references. Okay. And then you wouldn't have needed both. But so the, really, the reason that we need both, and we have this extra complexity, and all these trade-offs, is because we made a design mistake early on. I think it's useful to understand that sort of thing. So when you say we made a design mistake, are you just speaking of the general Java? The community? royal we that designed Java. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so as a programmer that uses Java, I'm just going to freely admit that I know what phantom and weak references are. I have no idea where they would ever be relevant to me in a sort of day-to-day uh, -day programming. Could you sort of so try to make that pitch? Yeah, the target audience of this talk is really uh, lower level developers, library developers. Um, the reality is uh, libraries like MapMaker and Guava really alleviate your need for having to think about those things. Um, other places where you might need to worry about phantom references and that sort of thing is if you're writing native code and you need to free up native memory. If you want to do that in a safe way, um, you have to use a phantom reference. So take, for example, um, a memory mapped file, that library in Java. Uh, it, you can't explicitly close a memory mapped file. Why can't you do that? Well, the reason is you could close it and then still try to access that memory, which has been freed and now points to some other uh, possibly reallocated native memory. Um, well, you could use a weak reference to keep track of when nobody references that memory mapped file anymore. Um, but then the reality of that is a finalizer runs after a weak reference. So that means um, somebody could write a finalizer that can still access that native memory after it's been freed, and that's obviously a very bad security hole. So where phantom references come in is they only get reclaimed after the finalizer runs and after there's absolutely no more references to that object. So they're less efficient in the sense that they have to run after all the finalizers run, but they're also more secure in the sense that um, when you're doing that cleanup, you're, you know for sure that nobody can have an access to that native memory, for example. Okay, so, so the target audience here is people like uh, people who are in charge of uh, Guava, Correct. people who are in charge of things like Spring, Juice. Um, tell me a little bit about Juice, just because I don't think the audience knows that much about Juice. It's kind of a, it's a topic that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, even though it's at the core of some of the most important Java projects. That right. are out there. So Juice is a lightweight dependency injection container. Um, when I say lightweight, that just means the design is lightweight. That does not mean uh, that the use cases are lightweight. It's used, for example, all over Google, all over Twitter, and we use it at Square. Um, in server-side use cases, it's, it handles very complex use cases. Uh, due to its lightweight nature, it also scales down. We also use it in Square's Android client, for example. It works just as well there as it does in a big server. Um, it came around a little bit after Java 5, so uh, it really benefited from annotations and generics. Uh, it didn't need to drag along like XML and that sort of thing anymore. So uh, it tends to be a lot simpler than uh, more pre-existing, bigger frameworks like Spring. Um, we've had three releases. Uh, they've all been, it tends to be a very, so it's a pretty mature framework at this point. 
Um, we've never had a point release because we've never had a bug serious enough to have one. Um, so, and we just recently released version 3.0 not too long ago. Uh, and the, I guess kind of the key feature there is that it supports JSR 330, uh, dependency injection annotations for Java, which is a JSR that I led. Um, and those annotations, they're supported by Spring and Juice and various other frameworks at this point, um, but they were originally inspired by Juice. Okay, Th this is my last question, and it's a question about Square. What's the most surprising thing about Square? I, when you left Google to go to Square, um, you, you signed on as a director of engineering, and then you very recently became the CTO. I actually started out as the Android lead, okay. and I created our Android app, um, along with uh, another engineer who joined sh that shortly after named Eric Burke, also an O'Reilly author. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess the biggest, most jarring thing for me is I was mostly focused on Java prior to Square, whereas nowadays, uh, being the CTO of Square, um, I'm more, very much more technology agnostic, and we use uh, a wide variety of technologies. For example, on the server side, we tended to be focused on, uh, we were much heavier uh, with regard to Rails. Uh, we've started to adopt Java for some of our core services, and we're also starting to move to the JVM for scalability reasons. Uh, for example, um, it's on our machines at least, uh, with Rails using MRI, that's kind of the default uh, VM for Ruby, mm -hmm. um, you can only have 20 workers. That means you can basically only have 20 concurrent requests. Whereas you know if you move to the JVM, you can have hundreds, maybe even thousands of concurrent requests. So that's, that's a huge deal um, when you're talking about uh, operations. You know, it's just like an order of magnitude or two uh, difference when it comes to servers and it really starts to add up. Square and Twitter are related by the fact that uh, it's the same person that actually founded both. Uh, and I know Twitter gave a keynote at OSCON about moving to Rails on the, on the JVM. Is there any communication in terms of the engineering teams? Very much so. Uh, yeah, they were both founded by Jack Dorsey, and um, Square's benefited a lot from the lessons Twitter learned. Uh, we followed similar paths, i.e. both using Rails. Um, so we knew really early on that we would have to move to the JVM if we were going to scale. So, so the final message is if you're using Ruby on Rails, you need to move to the JVM, or you just can't scale. Uh, if you want to scale, for sure, and uh, Based on my experience, it's much better to do it earlier on. It's harder to take a legacy Ruby app that depends on lots of C libraries and that sort of stuff and move it to JRuby. Um, we've had all, we found that to be a very big challenge. Um, so it's best to do it early on. Uh, the biggest challenge and the biggest downside is the deployment stuff is a little tricky compared to uh, uh, traditional Ruby. And I already said this, but I have to ask another last question. How do you deploy JRuby on Rails? So we're actually trying to figure that out right now. We have about uh, uh, we actually have a team together that's trying to figure out the best way. Um, there's like two possible, two main approaches that you can take. One, you can take like the warbler mm -hmm. approach where it bundles it up into a war and uh, sends it to production as a just a single file. And the other is more of the uh, traditional Ruby approach where you check out the code on the server and like download all the gems and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they both have their pros and cons. I, I personally lean towards the warbler approach uh, that, it, that is deploying a war building a war and deploying it to uh, a traditional Java server. Okay, great, thanks for joining us, and I will just say that that is a difficult problem to solve. It is. Let me know when you find a solution cool. so that we can tell our audience. I will do, I'll blog about it. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you.